Robert Gibb was born in Homestead, Pennsylvania, where he lives today. He's taught at Cedar Crest College, Lehigh University, East Stroudsburg University, Mount Union College, Carnegie Mellon University, University of Pittsburgh, and Carlo University, and not at Penn State. And this is his first time to State College, I've learned today. Homestead serves as a setting for much of his poetry, which includes seven books, the most recent being a retrospective selection entitled What the Heart Can Bear, published in 2009. Robert Gibb reached a certain stride with The Origins of Evening in 1998, which was W.W. W. Norton's National Poetry Series winter, winner and focused on Homestead. This was followed by The Burning World in 2004 and World Over Water in 2007, the three volumes comprising the Pittsburgh Trilogy. Robert Gibb has called the trilogy a widening autobiography, ranging outward to explore connections between memory and history, nature and culture, how the individual experience informs the collective account he has contributed poems, essays, and short stories to a wide variety of journals, including Antaeus, Esquire, Kenyon Review, Missouri Review, Poetry, Prairie Schooner, Southern Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, the Journal of Modern Literature, and the Journal of Evolutionary Psychology. Anthologies that include his work speak to its diversity. They include Hummers, Knucklers, and Slow Curves, contemporary baseball poems and Sweet Nothings, an anthology of rock and roll and American poetry. Robert Gibb's work has been featured in Ted Couser's syndicated column, American Life in Poetry. Welcome, Robert Gibb. Uh, thank you. And thank you for showing up tonight. I think I'll read the, uh, the poster poem first. It's the shorter and might be an introduction to the, am I doing this right? Can you hear? Is this okay? Uh, uh, so the poster poem is called uh, Steelworkers Lockers, Pittsburgh History Center. Uh, and I, th I don't know, it, it, you know it's, it's a poem in a way, well, it's a poem which the title kind of glosses and then it's also a poem about being a steel worker and uh, attending to the loss of, of, of all of that in uh, industry and uh, culture and, and then finding that it's a, uh, it's a treasure for, you know, for the archivists. Uh, so you go and you, you can't go to work, but you can go to a museum and they have the, le the lockers that you had at work and you can look at them there, although you can't, <laughs> you can't use them or, or, or <laughs> go out into the mills or whatever. Um, so it's a sort of lament, I suppose. The forlornness of metal, they might as well be titled, these salvaged relics, props from a set long struck, the lap welds and louvers <coughs> and green latch lock doors bolted in line in assembly each the width of a man crammed in or hung in parts as an effigy, the bench hard as a pew. Beyond, the mills were medieval, rows of stoves set four to the furnace, chimneys and groves, hoists where they elevated the stock. In the locker room, at the start of each shift, shucked aluminum suits got lowered on pulleys from their ceiling roosts. We changed into forge-proof shoes, the hard hat's day-glow halo, and stepped among flames out into the annealing where the world was turned to steel.
This is a kind of narrative poem called In the Emergency Room, and I think it's, it's uh, I don't think it needs any other setup. My son, at four months old, had lungs that flared up on the x-rays like spectral stones. Tablets upon which dark moss was growing. So we bundled him into Sacred Heart and sat huddled in the emergency room, praying the small fronds of his breathing would loosen into light. Outside, the gray sides of buildings gradually became the gray lengths of dusk filling the city a half-tone darkening upward as it emptied into the whole of the winter night. And so it seemed to me still, watching an intern cover the flesh of our son with his stethoscope's cold eclipse. Small, naked, without words, the child cried out his panic while I, with no words but love's helplessness and anger, stumbled and drew nearer that body, close to the distances it traveled through bone and broken water to be delivered into this life. All the while from beyond us, I could hear someone muttering, I don't know, six drinks, seven, maybe eight, and the doctor pleading, how can we help if you won't listen to us? You know you're killing yourself. And then our intern explaining how viruses curdle the cells. But he'll be fine. Just see that he takes these. Restoring us to our ordinary worries. With my wife gone to fill out forms, I gathered up the blankets and baby things and started to leave for the car, which is when I saw him splayed on the table before me, the soles of his feet yellow and soiled with earth as in Montagna's painting of Christ's foreshortened corpse, although these legs uncovered were almost violet in their mantle of veins, the color of homemade wine. I wondered how it was with him, whose death was a shimmering cup, and pain, something I might only hope to guess at, having come myself only so close to the bone. Uh, this one's not quite as <laughs> bleak. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is from my youngest son, uh, when he was uh, an infant, uh, and it's titled uh, for the inmate Pedro Velasquez, who restored a wooden tricycle for our youngest son's Christmas. Laving the red enamel so lovingly, the brushstroke left no wake. Did you also loose yourself from the cell blocks? and vanish into time? Did the balm of clear wood calm you, the bearings steeping in their oil? I picture the tricycle spread before you like a diagram, all parts, your hands as they move among them, carefully as though parsing out powder, the plush tongue of the candle blackening the bottom of its spoon. But what interests me this morning is the light, I imagine, flooding the prison workshop and your intent lone figure, illuminating the wheels and washers, the tiny crosses, and the heads of Phillips, and the domes, I'm sorry, and the domes of Phillips' head screws. I know it is only the cold fluorescence breaking from the long tubes banked above you casting each detail into sharp-edged relief, the still forged metals, your soiled thumbnail split lengthwise and to its quick. 
I know it is not the glare of heaven or arrangement in idealized space, such as the painter Velasquez glazed, filling the stalls of his street scenes until the ordinary shook with grace. I know, but still it falls upon you like your own painstaking shimmer, flawless as water below the lifted brush. And the last one is a poem by Phipps Conservatory, which is a greenhouse a big, uh, in, in, in Pittsburgh, um, and revisiting it uh, as an adult after having sort of hung out in it a little bit during uh, my adolescence. A dirigible of a building. It floats above the lily ponds and gardens, the long swale of lawns across which shadows are passing like summer clouds. I came here often growing up with my sketch pads and paints, trying to render pencil trees, the flaming bird of paradise, as if such attention were an act of faith. I sketched in the almost Ottoman scrolls of its roofs, the spidery lattices in which glass panes hovered like squares of light there above the fronds of date palms. A green world far removed from the flower-scented tissues my Aunt Hetty kept in her purse. The smothering bouquets of funerals, the neutered ones from church. Here, even the names seemed wild. Bear grass bristling, snake cactus writhing on its roots. Today, it is the sight of the cocoa shades, plush red vulva that soothes me, the delicate petals on the slender Buddha's lamp. In a room where orchids loll about their pollens, I watch fronds change to fish in a pond, and in the grotto, Underneath the sea hibiscus and satin wood, I find where I leaned against her, aching to ease the zipper further down her front, that she might spill gleaming as if from a tree, or I might reach into the brightness. Behind us, tears of moss and lichen spread from the rank clefts of the stones. What do plants remember? Or flesh? I run my hand along the wall while outside in the courtyard the bonsai deepen in their twisty sprawl. Thank you.